Goodbye and hello. How are you doing today? You guys doing well? All right. Awesome, man. Wasn't that a great time in worship today? Great time experiencing the presence of God. I love it. So good. Well, hey, I'm, I'm excited because we're starting a brand new series. And this is, uh, I think, going to be a life-changing series, not just for some people, but for all of us. And in this series, we're saying goodbye to anxiety, to fear, to worry, to depression, discouragement. And we're saying hello to joy to peace. Come on, how would you like to have more joy and peace in your life? I mean, it's like when you pull through the, the, the drive through and they're like, hey, uh, do you want fries with that? The answer is always yes. Um, it's never no. Now, some, my dad would pull this trick at the drive through because they'd, they'd, you pull up to McDonald's or Burger King or wherever, Carl's Jr., they're like, hey, would you like to, excuse me, sir, would you like to try our brand new Baconator with cheese? You know, and they give you the whole offer. And my dad would always say, yes, I'd love to try it. And then they'd say, great, that's going to be $17.95. You go, what? wait, that's too high. And then he'd make them go through the whole process. <sighs> Dad. <laughs> and uh, they'd be like, well, you have that new Baconator in there. And he's like, I don't want the Baconator. They said, you said you wanted to try it. Yeah, I'd like to try it. I don't want to pay for it. I don't want to <laughs> buy it. <laughs> How many of you are glad that, you, that dads are like that? Yes. He definitely was wearing like, Reeboks or something at the same time from white Reebok, dad shoes and dad jeans and all of it. So awesome. But we're saying goodbye to those things and hello to joy and peace and all of that. Now, I, I don't know about you, but you know, there's a lot of people in life that you're really happy to say hello to, right? Like my wife comes in, I'm like, hey, babe, how's it going? It's funny in marriage, you always walk into the room and you're like, oh, you're in here? Hey, <laughs> as if they shouldn't be or something. But anyways... <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of people in life I'm really happy to say hello to, like all of you. And then there's other people you're really happy to say goodbye to. You know what I mean? We had this person, some of you are like, I don't understand your humor. <laughs> it's awkward. This is a real me. So <laughs> we had a family friend, this man that would come to my house uh, when I was younger, uh, growing up at my parents' house, and he considered himself to be part of our family, but we didn't consider him to be part of our family. <laughs> So he'd be like, hey, I'm here. Hello. Hey, good to see you. I guess. <laughs> and then when it was time to go, it was like, bye. <laughs> right? How many of you have family like this, right? They're actually blood, but you're, you wish. Anyways, I won't. You don't raise your hand. Wade was like, yeah, no, don't, don't raise your hand. But uh, it's somebody, a comedian once said, there's the kind of people that you'll cry at their funeral, but you don't want to go on vacation with them. Right? Hello, goodbye, goodbye, hello. So we're talking about that today that, you know, anytime that you can say goodbye to depression, to anxiety, to fear, it's a good goodbye, isn't it? It's good to say goodbye to those things. And anytime you can say hello to joy and to peace and to freedom in your thoughts, to not being burdened down with anxiety and cares, that's a good thing, isn't it? And so over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about this and giving you practical handholds on how to deal with this in life, because this is a, a mass epidemic. And I'm going to read you some statistics that are frankly shocking. Uh, and they're actually a little bit old, a few years old. So I think it's even worse now, but it's very much a serious topic and an issue today. In fact, I know people that not, not people that are like out there in the world, but people in our life that literally can barely get out of their house because they're so anxious and afraid. And so I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if like, yes, I struggle with this because that'd probably make you anxious, right? I'd make me anxious if somebody made me raise my hand. But I just want to say to you, if you do deal with this, in fact, I think we all deal with this at some level, but if you deal with this at a, at a severe level, I believe that through the next couple of weeks that God is going to touch you in a major way and that you're going to have breakthrough in your life. So if you were thinking about skipping church next week or the week after, uh, do not do that because I believe every single message is going to be a building block in building a foundation of peace and joy and security and freedom in your life. How many of you are like, yes, I want to say hello to that. So we're saying goodbye to depression, discouragement, worry, anxiety, and learning what God, uh, how God has w created us and wired us, why we experience anxiety, where it comes from. And then most importantly, we're going to learn how to deal with it and get free in our life and just get out of it. So I'm excited about that. I want to read you a quote from this book, which I, I really want to highly recommend. It's called My Name is Hope. And it's a book by Pastor John Mark Comer. And he's a pastor in Portland. He actually grew up in Medford or that area where I'm from. And so we were probably at the park together at some point unknowingly or whatever. But 
Uh, he wrote a book called My Name is Hope, and it's one of the best books, not just on dealing with anxiety and worry. It's actually just one of the best books. It's really, really good. It's really interesting. It's well-written. It's poetic. It's, uh, it's insightful. And it's very helpful, uh, even just for me in my life, since, since I read it, just taking that truth and saying, you know what? I'm going to allow God to work in my mind and my heart to rule my thoughts and rule my emotions and walk out of anxiety, say goodbye and say hello to what God really has for me. So I want to read you this quote from that book. He said, staggering numbers of modern Americans fight anxiety and depression. In 2010, more than 253 million prescriptions were written for antidepressants in the U.S. Did you catch that? 253 million. The nation only has 311 million people. Uh, this at the time that was this was written. Words like pandemic come to mind. Were 80 plus percent of Americans really prescribed antidepressants last year? What gives? Antidepressants have become the second highest volume drug in the U.S. Only medications for cholesterol trump them in annual expense. In fact, in 2010 alone, because if there's anything Americans like more than depression, it's cheeseburgers. Am I right? All right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It's like, it's what we're all about. And I'll have fries with that. In fact, in 2010 alone, Americans spent $11.6 billion on antidepressants. Yet in spite of this reality, more than 34,000 people go the route of suicide every year. That's 94 suicides per day, one every 15 minutes. And for every success, there are more than 100 attempts. It is the third leading cause of death among teenagers. So when you hear this, you know, whether or not you are on a spectrum of, of dealing with this in a severe level or whether you're just kind of sometimes you get blue, whatever, this is a major problem in our culture. In fact, if we were to extrapolate from these statistics, then about eight out of every 10 of us here today, so somebody in your row, maybe that's you, are actually dealing with this severely where on a weekly or daily basis, it's hard for you to get control of the anxiety, the worry, the fear, and that, that leads into depression. It's hard for you to get control of this. And maybe you don't call it anxiety or fear, but you feel like you're out of control or you can't get your thoughts right or you can't just seem to break free from being dark and blue in your thinking, whatever that looks like. But this is a massive struggle. And I would say every single one of us deals with this. Now, I, I used to, when, you know, growing up, I would deal with, with depression and discouragement and I didn't necessarily know how to give it words. As an adult, I was able to sort of look at my life, look at my emotions and realize, wow, there's actually, I'm actually depressed or I'm discouraged right now beyond what my circumstances should be giving me. Does that make sense? Like, how do you know when you're dealing with this? It's when you look at the world around you and you say, the sun is shining outside, but it's not shining inside. Things maybe are not quite at catastrophic level on the outside, but they're, ca they're catastrophic on the inside. That's when you know there's something going on beyond the input that's being put in. Does that make sense? And we're going to talk about this. But I just want to tell you right now, and I think this is probably one of the most powerful things to know. If you're struggling with this, you are not alone. First of all, you're not alone in the struggle. A lot of people are struggling. Even in this room right now, you might be like, really, is anybody else struggling? Because you might look at people just like me and think, he's never discouraged. He never gets depressed. You, have, you don't know me on Monday morning. Bethany gets to see me on Monday when I come out of my cave and, you know, look around my, my domain. Uh, it's not a pretty sight. You might look at people who are well-dressed, otherwise successful, looking good. You know, what, they took their bath that month. You know, they, they've done all the right things. And you might not realize that they're actually fighting a battle on the inside and you're not alone. But the second thing that I want to say about you not being alone is you're also not alone uh, without hope of somebody helping you because God is here. We are here together as a family, as a, as a group, as a church to come around one another and fight this battle with you. So if you're sitting there going, man, I could never tell anybody. I'm afraid of the stigma. I can't, I can't talk about this. I can't admit it because it makes me look weak. It makes me look like I'm failing. I must be doing something wrong. There's something wrong with me. I just want to let you know that's one of the favorite tactics of the devil to keep you bound is to make you believe that you're all alone in whatever it is that you're struggling with. So you're not, you're not struggling in this alone. God is here to help you. We're here to help you. And there's going to be breakthrough in your life. But let's look today. I wanted to define some terms so that for the rest of the series, we're on the same page. Let's look at what anxiety is. I'll put this definition up on the screen. What is anxiety? Anxiety 
is a noun for all the grammar Nazis. You know the guy that wrote Hitler's speeches? It's actually a grammar Nazi. <laughs> a feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease. Typically, it's like how you might be feeling right now about that joke. <laughs> Typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome, like a football game, perhaps. A nervous disorder characterized by a state of excessive uneasiness and apprehension, typically with compulsive behavior and or panic attacks. John Mark Comer in his book, uh, My Name is Hope, he says, some bad feelings are really healthy, like fear. When you were on a plane and it's about to crash, you should be afraid. How many of you agree with this? <laughs> yep. <laughs> when your legally blind great-grandma offers to drive, you should be scared to death. <laughs> and maybe you're going to be scared actually to death because she's going to crash. Fear is not always bad. How many of you know there's times to be afraid? Um, I remember my mom and dad were pastors and they had a lady that went to our church. She since went to be with the Lord because she turned like 180 and then she passed away. But her name was Billy Elder and Billy was from Oklahoma and Billy was ancient. Like when, you know, a person that you know when you're young and then you get really old and then they're, but they were super old when you were young. You're like, how old are you? Right? She's like, back when Moses and I were in preschool together, you know, she was old. Like, her face was, I don't even have, like wrinkles an inch deep. I don't know how to explain it. And she would, she used to be the receptionist at the church in Medford and people would call in and, and uh, they'd say, Hey, I, have, I want to talk to is pastor Steve there. She'd say, I don't know where the pasture is right now. <laughs> and uh, she was our cook. Like in my internship, she would make us breakfast uh, at our Bible college. And, and, uh, uh, one time we came up to like get something that she had made. She wasn't ready for us to eat it yet. And she had a huge kitchen knife and she brandished it at us, you know? <laughs> How many of you know when you cross a certain age, you just, there's no, all bets are off. You just do what you want. <laughs> My life goal is when I cross 80, I'm just going to carry a cane and hit people randomly. <laughs> no reason. Kids running by. Ah. Right? When you cross 80, you can just do what you want. So anybody in 80 here, hey. You heard it from me first. Just, yeah, Gabby, you got a cane? Pff, pff, free reign. But Billy, uh, she used to pick me up from school, and she was the worst driver ever. So I understand this kind of fear. She was like somebody's, somebody's great-grandma's great-grandma. Like, she was old, and it was dangerous. And she'd be praying in tongues, literally, you couldn't even tell if her eyes were open. I think she was literally driving under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We, I actually, actually physically with my own eyes witnessed her hit another car, not realize it, and leave. <laughs> All that to say, fear is not always bad. Sometimes fear <laughs> is real. People say fear is false evidence appearing real. Not if there's a person that's attacking you, right, with a baseball bat. It's, it's real evidence appear, appearing real. It's rear. Fear is not always bad, but... When fear becomes perverted and warped into something long lasting and drawn out, you end up with something called anxiety. And this is, you know, we're laughing about it. We're laughing about fear, but, but the reality is it's not a laughing matter when it becomes something that goes beyond the moment. Anxiety is when fear takes over your mind. Anxiety is when fear moves from the tangible to the hypothetical. Anxiety is when the what ifs of life suffocate your brain. Anxiety is when you can't fall asleep at night. Anxiety is when you can't relax and take a nap. <clears throat> Anxiety is when your mind won't turn off. <clears throat> anxiety is when your imagination runs haywire with no boundaries or limits. Anxiety is when your chest is tight, your breathing shallow, and your head dizzy. <clears throat> anxiety is when your lungs speed up to a frenetic pace and your heart screams through your skin. Anxiety is ugly. And anxiety is something mental. It takes place in the realm of your mind and your thoughts and your brain. And then the second thing I want to talk about today is depression. What is depression? Depression is severe despondency and dejection, typically felt over a period of time and accompanied by feelings of hopelessness and inadequacy. Now, like we did with anxiety, we looked at fear that goes out of control becomes anxiety. Depression is simply sorrow and grief that goes out of control. And sorrow and grief is a healthy feeling. Grief, lament, pain, suffering, these are not all bad emotions or bad things. They make us human. When bad things happen, it's normal and natural to feel sad. You know, when someone that you love passes away, th that's normal to feel grief and sadness, right? So one of the things that people do in our culture now is they, they basically determine ahead of time, I, I should feel X, Y, Z uh, about a certain event. And therefore, if it goes outside of my 
expectation or parameters, then I immediately am going to go get a prescription for something or whatever. Actually, it's normal to feel sad when things go a different direction than you wanted them to go. Okay. How many of you believe that? That grief and pain and sorrow, lament, those are normal human emotions. But when that sorrow stretches out for a long period of time, when it goes out of control and it goes out of over the limits, that's when you're dealing with depression. So depression is when sorrow becomes a way of life, not a phase. When joy, hope, and life are snuffed out of your soul, when you are sad for no reason at all. When no matter how hard you try, fight, or work, you can't pull yourself out of a bad mood. When you wake up sad. When the day grows worse with each passing hour. When pleasure is like ash in your mouth. When family and friends are distant. When you're tired all the time. When dreams and desires for the future die and all motivation and energy is gone. When life is really, really horrible. That's what depression is. It's beyond a normal amount of sadness. It's out of control. Depression is emotional. So anxiety takes place in the realm of the mind. Depression takes place in the realm of the soul. It infects and ruins the realm of the soul. So it's interesting because as we do the research for this series and then even just exploring this topic, what we find is that when people deal with uh, anxiety, they also tend to deal with depression and vice versa. That these two things, fear that goes out of control and kind of overpowers you and becomes long lasting, leads you into depression and depression can actually lead you into fear that goes out of control. And it's interesting because in the book, My Name is Hope, uh, Pastor John Mark is talking about how doctors actually, when they're faced with this problem, they, they prescribe the same medication for anxiety and depression. Why is that? Because there's a recognition that the same root is at the, the cause of kind of both of these things. They manifest differently, but it's very common that if you're struggling with anxiety, you're also struggling with depression. And so he says, doctors are now only now discovering what Solomon said thousands of years ago, that anxiety in the heart of man causes depression. Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression. For a pre-modern, he was really quite brilliant. Anxiety and depression are linked in a vicious symbiotic web of codependency. The two are connected because the mind and the soul are connected. Solomon speaks of anxiety in the heart of man. Don't miss the gravity of what he's saying. The word heart in Hebrew is this word leb, which means inner part, thoughts, consciousness. Unlike our modern English word heart, the Hebrew word means your feelings and your thinking. So to the ancient Hebrews, the heart was the seat of your thoughts. In today's language, we'd say it's the mind. It's kind of that immaterial part of us. Ancient Hebrews called the heart the well. It's the part of us deep under the layers of topsoil where the soul bleeds. According to King Solomon, when there's anxiety in your mind, in your thoughts, in your imaginations, deep in that well, the result is depression in your emotions and feelings. So the point is this, how we think influences how we feel. If anxiety is how we think and it's affecting us there, it doesn't just stay there. It actually goes down deep into our soul and it begins to manifest in how we feel. Now, it's interesting because we're a culture that is in by and large driven by emotions. People will say things. It's actually fascinating. Even linguists have determined that this, the new generation, uh, younger generations, millennials, generation Y, so on and so forth, they don't say, this is what I think they say, this is what I feel. So people will say, I feel like your X, Y, Z. I feel, and people will say this about, about logistical, tactical, normal things. Like, I feel like this kind of cereal is my favorite. You feel that? I feel like Captain Crunch is sort of my jam, you know? Well, what's being, it's, it's interesting though that, that even language is reflecting that we're kind of an emotionally driven, feeling driven culture. And there's a lot of reasons for this philosophically that we don't have time to get into. It's there's a rejection. It's what we call postmodernism, a rejection of the modernistic philosophy that basically this kind of scientific naturalistic philosophy that led everybody to become hopeless in all the institutions politically, all, whatever. So anyways, people have just sort of bought into this idea that you can't really know anything. And so it's all about subjective feelings. And so we live in a very feeling driven culture. But what's interesting is that what's feeding into how we feel is our thinking, so even if you're not cogn cognitively, consciously aware of what's going on in the realm of your thoughts, you need to understand that it's impacting you at the level of your feelings, which is where most people are living their life out of. 
How you think, your thoughts, imaginations, mental patterns, it influences, it shapes and determines how you feel, your emotions, your moods, your feelings. That is why anxiety and depression are inseparable. So if we're gonna deal with depression and discouragement, we gotta deal with anxiety. If we're gonna deal with your feelings of depression and discouragement, we need to deal with your thinking uh, in the area of anxiety that's coming from fear out of control and what thoughts are creating that. Are you with me? All right, so let's move on. Here's a lifeline for you though, because I know we just talked about what's anxiety, what's depression, and maybe you're like, I'm anxious and depressed now and I just wanna go and talk about something happy. But listen, let me give you a lifeline and give you some really powerful, something really powerful today. If you can rule your thoughts, you can control your emotions. You see, one of the most broken, busted ways of thinking about depression and anxiety is that it's happening to you and you can't, do anything about it. That feeling of being suffocated, that feeling of being overpowered, that feeling of being unable to get out of bed, that feeling of inadequacy and inability. Do you know what I'm talking about? That right there is part of the problem because the reality is that if you can control, if you can rule your thoughts, if you can change how you think and get that thinking in line with God's word and get that thinking in line with how God made you to be, how he wired you and actually formed you and what your actual destiny and portion and how you're meant to live. If you can get your thoughts right, you can change how you feel, even when you feel bad. You see, this is a myth and an illusion that, well, I feel bad, therefore everything is bad, or I feel bad, therefore I'm stuck and I can't do anything. No, bad feelings are like a thermometer but they're not the thermostat. The bad feelings are the symptom of something that is a source. And if you can rule your thoughts and get control of your thinking, you can actually begin to dictate the course of your emotions. Now, I'm not talking about turning yourself into a robot where you never feel anything. You're just like, I am three, four, two, four, nine. I feel no emotion. All I do is pray, read my Bible and say, listen to Christian radio. I'm not talking about that. I'm, you're going to still feel human emotions, but you can control these out of order uh, explosions of depression and discouragement or anxiety. So if you can rule your thoughts, you can control your emotions. It says in Isaiah chapter 26, verse three, you will keep in perfect peace. How many of you like the word perfect peace? That are two words, perfect peace. That sounds good to me. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, speaking to the Lord, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Isn't it interesting in the Bible that we see a connection between thinking and feeling? And again, this is different than our culture because we say, I feel like, I, you know, I feel bad or I feel this way or whatever. In the scripture, there's always this connection. And it says, God will keep you in perfect peace. Despite your circumstances, he's gonna keep you in perfect peace all those who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. A lot of people need to fix their thinking because it's wrong, okay? And the way we fix our thinking is by fixing it, by aligning it, by sticking it to the Lord, by putting it on him, right? Jesus says he endured the, the shame and uh, humiliation of the cross because he, he kept his eyes on the prize for the, for the joy that was set before him. There's something about fixing your gaze, fixing your attention, fixing your thoughts on something. If you notice what happens in anxiety is that your, your thoughts get locked onto an area of fear, whether that's, oh my gosh, I think I might have a disease or, oh my gosh, I think that my husband might cheat on me or, oh my gosh, I think I'm gonna lose my job or, oh, what would happen if the, you know, everybody died in a plane crash or what would happen, and, right? And then you get fixed on that thing and it creates this out of control fear. When you fix your thoughts on God, what happens is peace permeates and saturates. And this is not a new thing. And I, I think this is interesting, you know, going back to the fact that you're not alone, that we don't, this isn't something that's a modern problem because we see that biblical figures, these people that we tell these stories about from the Bible, <clears throat> they dealt with the exact same thing because there's always going to be a pull in a broken, fallen world to let fear rule our thoughts and minds and pull us away from what God wants us to do and who he's called us to be. We see in the Bible that different biblical characters dealt with this. David, we just went through a whole series talking about the life of David. He dealt with it. It says in Psalms 42, 11, listen to these words. This is a prayer. These are words that come down to us from history. This is a song that David was singing, a prayer he was praying. Why, my soul, are you downcast? A lot of people think Christians are just like perfect, happy, Pollyanna. Everything is perfect. Everything is yay. No, 
Why are you downcast, my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. David dealt with circumstances that caused fear and, and trembling and all these kind of things. He went through hard things in life and he dealt with his emotions, overpowering. Uh, the prophet Elijah dealt with it. It says in 1 Kings 19, 3, Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He just had this great victory over the prophets of Baal. I don't have time to tell the whole story, but there was this evil king and queen, Ahab and Jezebel. And he, Elijah showed him up on top of this mountain. And so uh, Jezebel said, I'm going to kill you. Basically, if you're alive tomorrow, then something's wrong. Like, I'm coming after you. So this is where Elijah fled. Uh, he's afraid. He goes to Beersheba, a town in Judah, left his servant there. And then in verse 4, then he went on alone into the wilderness. This is what men do, isn't it? When they get discouraged and depressed. Not me. I go alone into my room or whatever. And it's, to me, it's silly to go into the wilderness. Why wouldn't you want to be comfortable and in a heated room? But anyways, but real men go out into the wilderness to deal with, to feel their feelings. I'm not crying. My eyes are sweating. <laughs> then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. You're down when you're praying that you're going to die. God, you know, I just come before you humbly with my petitions. Would you kill me? How many of you are glad for some of the prayers God doesn't answer, right? <laughs> Says he prayed that he might die. He said, I've had enough, Lord. Maybe you don't, you're, some people are like, I don't know how to pray. Look at the prayers in the Bible. I have had enough, Lord. It's like you're being disrespectful to your parent, but you remember at the last minute to say, sir or ma'am. <laughs> this is absolutely ridiculous, sir. You know, <laughs> my kids do that. They're like, I don't, I don't know. Dad, I guess. Oh. <laughs> Elijah, <laughs> I've had enough, Lord. <laughs> he said, take my life. For I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. That sounds like fear. That sounds like discouragement. That sounds like depression. That sounds like suicidal thoughts. Elijah had just had the greatest victory of his life, and now he's in the, the deepest pit of depression and discouragement, literally asking God to kill him. Now, the crazy thing about Elijah is when he prays this prayer, he actually believes that God answers these prayers because he's just prayed to God to light an altar on fire from heaven, and it happened. And he prayed that the rain would begin to fall. Now, if you've prayed prayers like fire falling from heaven and rain falling from the sky and they've been answered and then you pray like 24 hours later, God, kill me, he wants to die. Oh, no, 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 no. Elijah is just, this is metaphorical. No, this is real depression. This is real agony of the soul. Don't feel like you're alone. He says, God, kill me. And then we go into the New Testament, we find out even Jesus dealt with this. Jesus, not, this isn't like another Jesus. I mean, the real Jesus, right? Like the right answer to every answer in Sunday school. Listen, it says in Mark 16, 32, they went to the olive grove called, grove called Gethsemane and Jesus said, sit here while I go and pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him. And it says he became deeply troubled and distressed. How does the son of God, God incarnate in the flesh, how does he become deeply troubled and and distressed. And in verse 34, he told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. I'm so sad. I'm so down. My soul is so crushed that I feel like I might die. This is Jesus saying this. Now, if you feel, again, if you feel like you're alone, you need to understand that Jesus himself understands how you feel. Because in this moment, when he was looking at the cross, the anxiety and the fear and the depression and that darkness that he felt, which is, it's a reality for anyone that is walking on this planet, including God when he was incarnate in Jesus. Now, I don't have time to go into all the theology there, but you need to understand feeling discouraged or depressed or whatever doesn't mean you're bad and it doesn't mean you're weak. Because if Jesus felt it, if Elijah felt it, if David felt it, if Moses felt it, I mean, if you go through almost every single biblical character that's listed as this like example for us to follow, they struggled with dealing with their mind and their heart. They struggled with anxiety, with fear, and with depression. And it doesn't mean you're bad or weak. It means you're a human being. But listen, the big truth, the, the, the good news about this, and what we're going to talk about in this whole series, and why you don't want to miss any of it, the big truth is that you don't have to live this way. 
because it's not God's portion for you. It's not his plan for you. It's not his uh, inheritance for you. See, the thing about all these biblical characters, they went through depression. They went through anxiety. And what's the key word in that sentence? Through. You're going to go through the valley of the shadow of death. Come on, it says in Psalms 23, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Come on, you walk through the valley. There's another Psalm that says, I walk through the valley of weeping, but God turns it into springs. You're gonna walk through, but you're not meant to walk to and not leave. And that's what I wanna speak to you today from the scriptures and and by by the spirit of God, I believe this, that you need to believe that if you are struggling in this area, of anxiety, fear, and worry, to whatever degree you are, that you are on a journey through it, not a journey to it, and that's it. You're on a journey through it. All of these people walked through it. Jesus walked through it, but he got out of it. Come on. And there's gonna be times where you walk through it and you get out and maybe it tries to come back or maybe something happens and you're dealing with it. But guess what? God wants to deliver you and bring you through it. Every one of these people in the Bible broke through anxiety, depression, and fear into hope, peace, and joy. Now, let me just give you some scripture, some, some of the uh, some Bible verses to encourage you today as we get ready to close. 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Did you know that God's portion for you is not fear? God isn't giving you fear. God is giving you power and love and a sound mind, a, a, a disciplined mind. Whenever fear and anxiety tries to take over your thoughts, you need to say back to it, no, that's not my portion. Come on, that's not my portion. That's not what I was created to walk in. God has not given me a spirit of fear. He's given me a, a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. John 14, 27, this is Jesus. He said, peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you, Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Jesus spoke to his disciples and said, your portion, if you follow Jesus, your portion is not despair. Your portion is not chaos. Your portion is not anxiety that's running out of control. Your portion is peace. And you need to stand on the word of God and say, my portion is peace. If I have no peace in my life, that's not the default state of things. I'm called to walk and live and dwell in a place of peace. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. God cares about your cares. God cares about your cares. He cares about what you care about because he cares about you. I think this is so fascinating because when you have kids, it gives you a whole new perspective on how God must see you. And so for me, becoming a father, I've been, my oldest daughter seven So for the last seven years, being on a journey of watching and observing my children and how they operate and think and live and just being amazed because so many revelations that God gives to me of how he thinks about me. And it's fascinating because my kids come to me on a regular basis and they say, dad, you know, they're, they're, they're anxious about something. What are we going to do today? What are we going to eat? Can I have more crackers? You know, what, what's going to happen if this kid isn't at my birthday party? And you know, dad, how long till we get to the Great Wolf Lodge? And there's all these cares and concerns, right? That are like so small and, and in, you know, just insignificant to me. But because of my relationship with that sweet little girl, Penelope or Evie or my little boy, Jack, I care about their cares. And I help them bear their burdens. When they're struggling with something, I'll put them on my knee and we'll talk about their cares. And it makes me think about, I'm such an imperfect father, but God is perfect. And when he tells me to cast my anxiety on him because he cares for me, this isn't something sort of like offhanded, oh, you know, cast your anxiety on God, whatever. No, God is saying, hey, come here, come here. There's a place on my knee. Come here, sit, sit right here and let's talk about what you care about. And you go, well, yeah, but God doesn't care about my stupid relationships. And he doesn't care about my stupid job situation and my emotions. Yeah, yeah he does. He really does because he's your father and he loves you. And your portion is not anxiety, it's peace. Your portion is not fear. Come on, it's hope. Your portion is not depression, your portion is joy. So over the next two weeks, we're gonna discuss God's plan to deliver us, right? What we need to do in our part in getting our thoughts fixed on him, 
God's plan to deliver us, to transform us, so that we can say goodbye to fear, anxiety, worry, depression, discouragement, and we can say hello to hope, to peace, and to joy. You excited about that? Amen. Let me pray for you today. Father, right now, come before you. I thank you for every person here today. And God, I know so many of us, we struggle to deal with this, whether it's at a, at a minor level or a severe level, Lord, but we, we deal with anxiety and worry and fear. And God, we live in a very fearful time and a very chaotic time. And so there's so much to be distraught about and have anxiety about. But Lord, I thank you that your portion for us is not anxiety, fear, or worry. It's hope, it's peace, it's joy. And so Lord, I pray right now, even as we have gone through this message today, that by your Holy Spirit, you would come and touch people. If you want to receive from the Lord right now, you just want to just receive a portion of his peace, you just lift up your hands, just all around the room, just lift up your hands and just receive it. God, I pray that you would come right now and bring peace. God, I pray right now that you would come and bring joy. Come against the spirit of depression, discouragement that won't leave, that won't let us up off the mat. And Lord, I pray right now for a release of hope. God, even if we feel like, man, I don't really know if I have the tools, that Lord, at least we would get our eyes on you and say, you know what? Maybe I don't know what to do, but God does. And I'm gonna keep looking at him, walking towards him, praying, believing, and expecting that he's gonna move in my life. I pray for a release of peace, new hope, new joy. Come against the enemy that Lord would wanna come and even make it worse, Lord, the anxiety and the fear that's there. And Lord, I pray for a release of your peace, joy, and hope in Jesus' name. Amen.